anyway, the Lagrangian is L0 plus L1 plus L2. L0 is the uh, normal one that one uses before renormalization. And this is in Weinberg notation. L1 is, well actually L0 plus L1 are what we had been using. And then L2 is the counter term of Lagrangian 1 minus or minus a quarter C3 minus 1 F mu nu F mu nu minus C2 minus 1 D slash plus M psi plus Z2 delta M psi bar psi minus I So forth. And what one can do then is to sum this as a series 
it's 1 over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon times 1 plus pi star over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon plus pi star over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon squared plus the same thing q plus dot 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 and this is our favorite geometric series and so you get delta prime is 1 over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon times 1 over 1 minus pi star over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon and then multiplying through you get 1 over q squared plus m squared minus pi star uh, minus i epsilon. Okay. So that's the that's what the full propagator then is. And now what we know <coughs> is we don't know what this thing is as a function of q squared. But we do know that near q squared equal to minus m squared in Weinberg's metric, um, then we have a pole in this thing. We know this thing is supposed to be, we know this has to be 1 over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon near q squared equal to minus m squared. And so that tells us that pi star of um, minus m squared is equal to zero. Because if this had a value that was different from zero, then it would be changing the mass. And this is the physical mass. The next thing is that we also know that the residue up here is one because this is the, we know the propagator has to be this move of one here, not three or two and a half. Again, we've taken out the two pi to the fourth. So that means that also, that, that means that pi star of q squared has to be, has to have a leading term, which is, say, b q squared squared plus c squared cubed plus and so forth. Well, I, sh I should have written this as q squared plus m squared because we're expanding around minus m squared. So it looks like that. In other words, when q squared is equal to minus m squared, the thing is identically zero, and the departure from zero doesn't, doesn't involve a term that's linear in q squared plus m squared because if it did, it would change, it would multiply q squared plus m squared here by a factor, and that would change the residue from one. Okay. In other words, were this thing equal to it would be like a one minus a. Yeah, yeah, right. Let me let me just back do it explicitly. If there were an a q squared plus m squared plus dot dot dot, then this delta prime would be one over one minus a times q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And that would mean that the residue was, was 1 over 1 minus a rather than rather than 1. And that's a no-no. So those are the two conditions that one derives for this uh, um, for the uh, for this one particle irreducible thing in, uh, in the scalar case. Now in the vector case, the thing is more complicated and I'm tempted to assign this as a homework problem or I could do it in class. Um, I'm not sure which to do with it. By the way, I did assign uh, two little homework problems. One is to compute the area of the unit sphere in four dimensions and I gave a big hint uh, the big hint is compute, uh, com 
compute the Gaussian e to the minus x squared in d dimensions in rectangular coordinates and in spherical coordinates. You compare the two, you immediately get, you quickly get the, the, the right answer. And then the second homework problem, what was the second homework problem? Oh yes, the second homework problem is to show explicitly what the contribution is of this term, of this count term is. So you bring this count term down in the lowest order and see what that is. All right, now let's get back to dimensional regularization. The basic idea, as back Jason emphasized, is analytic continuation. Let yes. us remember what this is. Suppose we had some function 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed plus dot dot dot. So it's the sum z to the n, n equals 0 to infinity. Okay, well, what we know is that if the absolute value of z is less than 1, then we can sum this thing, and it's 1 over 1 minus z, which in fact is what we were doing here exactly. And so we can say that this, we can reinterpret this power series as an analytic function that just has a pole at z equal to 1. Everywhere else is finite, well defined. On the other hand, the original power series gets worse as the real part of z increases. Or if we may just let z be real, then as, as it says z equal x increases, as x increases, this thing gets worse and worse. And I mean, it just simply diverges. Whereas this thing is, again, for z real, is just 1 over 1 minus x. So for x equal 2, it's minus 1. Whereas for x equal 2, this thing is very badly diverted. So what, what happens is that with analytic continuation, you get a sensible expression for not only a sensible expression, but a unique expression for uh, the extended analytic function, um, but it's not the same as the extrapolation of the thing that you started with to other values. Okay. So there's, a, there's this curious business going on. And what what we saw was that, let's see, let's just review pi star rho sigma um, of q squared. It was minus i e squared over 2 pi to 4 default p big trace. And um, I don't know if I should write all this down, minus i slash plus m gamma rho minus i p slash minus q slash plus m gamma sigma. And then this was over the two propagators p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon and p minus q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. All right, so this is what we started with last time. And this, in particular, is for the diagram where we have a um, fermion propagator with momentum p, and then another fermion propagator with momentum p minus q, and um, a vertex here and a vertex there, those give you the e, and the gamma rho, and the gamma c. Okay. Now, the first thing we did was we used Feynman's trick of this 1 minus x a plus b x squared, and we were able to write that in a, in a um, nicer form. 
and we introduce the traces. And let me skip several steps because we did go through this last time. And we eventually got something of like 40 squared over 2 pi to the fourth. Integral 0 to 1 dx. Integral, oh, and we also, we saw that at least if q squared was, if minus q squared was less than 4m squared, then, and by the way, the, the 4 comes because there's a factor of x, 1 minus x. x, 1 minus x, if x is between 0 and 1, has a maximum at x equal to half, and the maximum is 4m. Um, we did, we, we saw that this thing, after the, after the uh, Feynman trick was something that had poles, um, let me see, yes, here and here, and so we then rotated that up to, made it an integral like this, and so we then had a Euclidean, um, uh, and now it's e fourth p Euclidean, and it's um, minus p. Oh, we also did a, after doing this, we sent p to p uh, p plus q, p plus q x, and that simplified things. And then we and then we did the wick rotation, and we got to this stage p plus q x rho p minus q 1 minus x sigma plus p plus q x dot p minus q 1 minus x eta rho sigma minus p plus q x sigma p minus q 1 minus x rho plus m squared eta rho sigma. And this was divided by um, p squared plus m squared plus q squared x1 minus x squared. OK, so this um, has p to the fourth in the denominator. It has a p squared in the numerator and effectively a p cubed here. So this is actually uh, p to the fifth dp over p to the fourth, so it's pdp, which is um, uh, quadratically divergent. So it's effectively an infinity square. And the dot products are Euclidean dot products. All right, well, the idea is that there's physics going on that we don't understand at high energies of short distances. And so we want to, and so these, these things really are, so, if we're doing these correctly, these things are to be somehow finite. But, and so we need to make them finite, but we need to make them finite in a way that doesn't screw up the symmetries of the theory, and which is to say gauge invariance or Renz invariance. And um, so the way to do that is to imagine that this integration here is not in four dimensions, but instead is in d dimensions. And um, we're then and now if we, if we take D to something like 2, then um, what we've got is uh, PDP, P cubed, let's see, there's a P squared there, P cubed DP over P to the fourth, actually that's still a lot of divergent. All right, we go down to one and a half dimensions. <laughs> All right. Anyway, the idea is that by using, by by making d complex and then using these counter terms, uh, 
bring them into the calculation and saying that, well, the part that's high diversion uh, will cancel, and uh, that part is the part that we don't understand. Okay, so it's certainly true, whether we dimensionally continue or not, that something like P rho, P uh, sigma is going to become an uh, is going to become an eta rho sigma um, times p squared over d. I mean, we, this would be true even in in um, Actually, I don't know why he does eta rho sigma, because we're here already Euclidean space, and so this is really delta rho sigma. So I think, in a sense, it's really delta rho sigma. Anyway, um, and the same thing, so, so the fact that, that these do what we said they would do, namely p mu, p mu, p nu, p rho, p sigma, or if you want, if you're, before you've done the wick rotation, this would go to p squared squared, and then as I said last time, eta mu nu, eta rho sigma, plus the two other terms. And um, so that's, that's so, oh, divided by, of course, p, p plus two. And then the area of the unit sphere, the thing that you're going to calculate is 2 times pi to the d over 2 over gamma to the d over 2. Of course, when you do the thing as a homework problem, you show that this is true for integer values of d. And then you can extrapolate and it will continue. Okay. Well, once you've um, introduced, we now have to replace d fourth p Euclidean by d to the dp, and just to follow Weinberg's notation, uh, he writes this as um, d to the d. Uh, let's see. Uh, he writes this as kappa, where I don't under, I think that's sort of silly. I'm going to say with my notation. This is omega d um, p to the d minus 1 dp. This is effectively what, what happens, where this is the area of the unit sphere in d dimensions. And once one does that, then one has that this expression here becomes 4 e squared omega d over 2 pi to the 4. And now integral 0 to 1 dx. Integral 0 to infinity p to the d minus 1 dp. And now up here, minus 2 p squared over d eta rho sigma plus 2 q rho sigma x1 minus x. I guess what's happened, all right, let, let me uh, back up a little bit. We, the, the, the dot products of you are Euclidean are down here. Up here, the numerator came from this trace structure, and I think we still have, we, we, we must be keeping the, um, the indefinite metric up there. In other words, this really is an eta. Okay. Anyway, it's Okay, plus p squared minus q squared x one minus x eta rho sigma plus m squared eta rho sigma. So it's all of that. And now we're dividing that by p squared plus m squared plus q squared x1 minus x squared. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use some formulas which 
make perfect sense for d complex with the real part of d sufficiently small, namely p to the p minus 1 divided by p squared plus nu squared squared dp. And this is a half nu squared to the d over 2 minus 2. Where these formulas come from, I don't know. But there are apparently well-known integral formulas. Which is what Weinberg is asking. Um, zero to infinity. Now p to the d plus 1 dp over p squared plus nu squared squared is then a half nu squared. And now uh, e over 2 minus 1 gamma to the 1 plus d over 2 gamma to the 1 minus d over 2. OK, so these formulas are correct for complex d as long as the real part of d is sufficiently small. But what we're going to do then is apply them to this structure here and say, and then interpret them as a, a gamma, of course, is an analytic function. And, um, and so we're going to have an expression that is defined for complex D. Everything makes sense if the real part is sufficiently small, sufficiently negative, or if it's sufficiently small. On the other hand, by analytic continuation, the, the, the right-hand side defines an analytic function that um, is, in fact, let me just remind you what gamma of z is. Gamma of z is an integral 0 to infinity e to the minus t, t to the z minus 1 dt. If I'm, my memory serves me, um, gamma of 0 then diverges. And this actually, let me just uh, dwell on this for a moment, remind you about the gamma function. You see, this, for, for the, if the real part of z <coughs> right, if the real part of z is greater than zero, this is perfectly well defined. The problem comes when the real part of z is zero or, or negative, because then you get a pole at t equals 0. Pole here is at t equals 0. This exponential means that no matter what power you have, if, if z were, say, 4, this is just t to the 4, but e to the minus t, so there's no problem. It's when z has a, when the real part of z starts to get, to becomes 0 or negative, then you have a pole at the origin. And that's the problem. T um, so this is initially defined by this integral only in the right half plane and not even on the imaginary axis. On the other hand, what you can do is you can look at gamma of z plus 1, for example. This is integral 0 to infinity e to the minus t, t to the z dt, because we replace z by z plus 1. You can rewrite this as integral 0 to infinity minus d by dt of e to the minus t, t to the z dt. And of course, I haven't done anything here because the derivative of the exponential is just the thing itself. Now we integrate by parts, and what we get is 0 to infinity e to the minus t d dt, t to the z dt. And this gives you integral 0 to infinity e to the minus t z, t to the z minus 1 dt, which is z gamma of z. Um, I've dropped the surface terms of uh, e to the minus t and t to the z at infinity, obviously, and at uh, equals zero as long as, again, the real part of z is positive. 
<coughs> anyway, we then get this identity, gamma of z plus And then what we can do, you see, is say that gamma of z is 1 over z gamma of z plus 1. Well, the right-hand side is defined as long as the real part is positive. But now the real part of z can be as can be minus 0.9, and then the real part of minus 0.9 plus 1 is still positive. This thing is well defined, and we've defined this here. And then uh, what we can do is write this as 1 over z, 1 over z plus 1, gamma of z plus 2, and so forth. And then what we do gradually is we analytically continue into the left half plane. In fact, we can analytically continue it to everywhere except for poles at 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. Apart from that, the function's analytic. And so that's an example of analytic continuation that's a little more relevant to dimensional regularization. But anyway, that's what's going on. And um, are there any questions? Does anybody need a trunk? All right, well. If we now apply these two formulas to um, this expression here, what we get is pi star rho sigma of q, actually. I shouldn't have written it as q squared. No, I it. 2 e squared omega d over pi to 4, and now it's equal 0 to 1 dx. And now what we've got is the following. It's 1 minus 2 over d, a to rho sigma, m squared plus q squared, x, 1 minus x, to the d over 2 minus 1. You see, this is what's come from these formulas over here, that corresponds to nu squared. <coughs> and that gives us then gamma of 1 plus d over 2, gamma of 1 minus d over 2. And then there's another term, which is 2 q rho q sigma x 1 minus x minus q squared eta rho sigma x 1 minus x plus m squared eta rho sigma and then m squared plus q squared x 1 minus x d over 2 minus 2 and then this times gamma d over 2 gamma of 2 minus d over 2. Alright, so that's that's what happens. And again, this all makes perfect sense if the real part of D is small enough. Um, then Weinberg whips out a magic identity. 1 minus 2 over D gamma to the 1 plus D over 2. And of course, this was originally developed by the Hoft and Veltman back in 1970s. 1 plus d over 2, 1 minus d over 2. This, in other words, this thing up here can be rewritten as minus gamma of d over 2, gamma of 2 minus d over 2, which is the same as this. So then you can combine the two terms, and what you get is the pi star rho sigma of q is 4e squared omega d over <coughs> Five and four gamma of d over two gamma of two minus d over two q rho q sigma minus q squared 
eta rho sigma times an integral 0 to 1 dx x 1 minus x m squared plus q squared x 1 minus x so d over 2 minus 2. All right. <coughs> now, notice that this d over 2 minus 2, if d is 4, this is 0, and so we'd be tempted to just ignore this. But in fact, this thing, of course, as d goes to 4, this is gamma of 2 minus 2, which is gamma of 0, and that's one of the poles here. Um, and so there's a singularity here, and um, that, because of that singularity, we have to be careful about this. Um, one curious factor here is, suppose we've been doing this calculation in five dimensions. Well, then we would have used this analytic continuation and so forth, and we would have had gamma of 2 minus 2 and a half. That's gamma of minus a half. That's finite. So in other words, there's this, this, this dimensional regularization with analytic continuation. It, it works, but um, it's what you get with analytic continuation is a great deal different from what you started with. I mean, we're not done yet, right? No, 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 no. It not. hasn't worked yet, because we still have four. Huh? D equals four, we still have this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just wanted to point out that if we had been working in five dimensions, yeah. we'd still have something finite. And so this is something really um, curious here. Notice also that the structure of this is, um, as I said, exactly what we want uh, by current conservation. In other words, because Q rho times pi star rho sigma uh, is zero. Okay. Because you get q rho into this would give you q squared q sigma minus q squared q sigma, which is zero. So this term gives you zero. And this is what we want from current conservation. And I went, I went through that last time, and I, I, don't, I don't think I need to repeat that. Um, now, as I said, for the homework problem, you're going to show that there's a contribution to this um, propagator, to this whole propagator, namely pi star rho sigma sub L2 of Q, which is minus Z3 minus 1 times Q squared eta rho sigma minus Q rho. Sigma. Sorry for the handwriting. Okay. And so all together, we can say the pi star rho sigma of q is then q squared eta rho sigma minus q rho q sigma times little pi of q. Well, actually, of q squared. And little pi of q squared is then minus 4 e squared omega d over <coughs> pi to the fourth gamma of d over 2 gamma of 2 minus d over 2 integral 0 to 1 dx x 1 minus x m squared plus q squared x 1 minus x and d over 2 minus 2. That and then the counter term minus z 3 minus 1. Okay. So it's that whole um, expression. Any questions? Are you in trouble? Sure. All right. 
So what we do is we, is we want the Z3 to cancel the part here that's singular. And in other words, what we want is that pi of 0 should equal 0. Now this is the analog of what we did over there for the scalar case. And this is, it turns out that it, in, in this spinner case, because pi already has a factor of q squared in front of it, pi affects the residue rather than the location of the pole. And um, so pi to have residue right. of pole at q squared equals zero. This is the photon mass is photon. We're talking about the photon problem. And so that's what we want. So we want when q squared is equal to zero that um, that this thing should be zero. And that then tells us that that Z3 should be 1 minus 4 e squared omega d over 2 pi to the fourth gamma <coughs> to the d over 2 gamma to the e minus d over 2. And then if we set, you see, q squared equals 0, well then this thing is gone and we just have m squared to the d over 2 minus 2. So this is m squared to the d over 2 minus 2, and then an integral of 0 to 1, x1 minus x dx. <coughs> and, um, well, one can do that integral, and then you get an expression for what, for what z3 is. Now, z3, then, uh, as we let d approach 4, uh, z3 then has this pole. Although, as I said, if we work in five dimensions, it wouldn't. But it doesn't matter that z3 has uh, a pole because z3 is one of these counter terms. In other words, when you write down this Lagrangian, you really don't know um, what these extra, what these z's are. They, they could be uh, infinite quantities. The important thing is to have the, the, the finite things, which is to say this, this pi, this, this pi rho sigma be of this form with this thing equal to zero when q squared is zero. All right, so once we set z3 equal to what I just said, then we get an expression for pi of q squared. And it's minus 4 e squared omega d over 2 pi to the 4 gamma to the d over 2 gamma to the 2 minus d over 2, integral 0 to 1 dx, x, 1 minus x, and then all this times m squared plus q squared x, 1 minus x, to the d over 2 minus 2 minus m squared to the d over 2 minus 2. And when we look at this, we see that there's this pole here, so we're not quite out of the woods yet. On the other hand, uh, what is this gamma of uh, 2 minus d over 2? Well, gamma of 2 minus d over 2 is approximately 1 over 2 minus d over 2 minus gamma little gamma, where little gamma is 
zero point five seven seven dot dot dot. This is known by the, to the Germans as Euler's constant, and to the Italians as Mascheroni's constant. Um, by the way, Euler, I was shocked. Euler was living in the 18th century. And uh, he produced one of the forms for the gamma function, one of the expressions for the gamma function, which exhibited all the poles of the negative integers and so forth. Pretty amazing. OK, so we've got this um, pole here. And if we, if we take this expression and put it in here just to look at what z3 is and do this integral, then we find that this is um, that z3 minus 1 the infinite part of it is e squared over 6 pi squared t minus 4. So that's that's the infinite part. What does that mean? The part that doesn't have gamma? A little gamma? Well, the part that, in other words, actually, I'm worried as to why there isn't any M in there. I think there must be an M in there. <coughs> well, I don't know. He, he has a, Weinberg has a particular way of evaluating this and says this is this. But yes, it is the infinite part. And yeah, you're right. This, the, the, this with the, the M will contribute to the finite part and the various things that contribute to the finite part. To the infinite part. Okay. So now this is the expression we have low for pi. And now um, what's the story? Well, this, of course, some a to the z, of course, is e to the z log a. Right? And so we apply that to this. And then what we find is that this structure here is um, e to the d over 2 minus 2 times the log of this structure here, log of m squared plus q squared x 1 minus x. Um, Right. Minus e to the d over 2 minus 2 log m squared. And I should have factored out an m squared. But um, this then gives us d expanding. The, one, the ones are going to cancel. And we're going to get d over 2 minus 2 times log of m squared plus q squared x 1 minus x minus log of m squared, so that's over m squared. So that's what the integrand is near uh, d4. And then this thing here, of course, is 1 over 2 minus d over 2 minus gamma. And so what happens is that this cancels that. And so this thing is finite. So in other words, um, the, 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 the part that's singular here is uh, cancels this, and so what we're left with is pi of q squared is equal to e squared over 2 pi squared integral 0 to 1 x 1 minus x log 
of this thing. So in other words, if I divide through by m squared, <coughs> what I get is 1 plus this m squared. So this is then log of 1 plus q squared x, 1 minus x, over m squared dx. All right, so that's the final answer. Um, and um, as you can see, it's finite, it's proportional to e squared. And um, it was first derived, by the way, by Schwinger in uh, 1949. He didn't use dimensional regularization, he used other methods. But, um, but uh, that's, um, that's the final answer for the vacuum polarization. So let's see, you get a handy various questions. Anybody else want to ask a question? Uh, or somebody particularly hungry, uh, give a shout and I'll throw you a can. All right, so that's, um, that's what one gets. Now, um, what Weinberg does, <coughs> does next is um, compute what the, he interprets this by, by thinking about a scattering problem in which you would have, this would be your lowest order diagram, and then the correction to that would be this one loop, and then this counter term, which we put in, which one could write as, sometimes people write them like that. So the sum of these two is basically what we just calculated. Um, at, at least we calculated this, this part of that. And, um, you would just replace the propagator you would normally use with this new one, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, in fact, that's that's this issue of something that maybe you want me to go through the what this looks like for the spin one case. It's a little more complicated than um, not, not this, right? The first photo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So now I have to find some board space. The darkest board that I can see is that one over there. So I'm going to go down there. Let's do the following. Pi mu nu 
chi nu rho and the star doesn't mean complex conjugate, it's just it's just um, just means this one loop, oh I'm sorry, one one particle irreducible one particle irreducible corrections to loop photon propagator. So this thing then is Q squared delta. If you lower the nu, this becomes delta. So it's delta mu nu minus Q nu Q nu times chi. Q squared delta nu rho minus Q nu Q rho chi. Uh, now if you multiply that out, you see you get Q squared squared delta mu rho, and then you get minus 2 q squared q mu q rho plus q mu q rho q squared times pi squared. And so this is equal to pi star mu rho times q squared pi. So this matrix its projection operator on a factor, it's a proportional projection operator, the square of the matrix gives you the matrix times a factor. Right. Now, out of the blackboard space again.
Okay, so what we have then is that this delta prime mu nu is delta mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon plus pi star mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon squared plus pi star mu nu pi q squared over q squared minus i epsilon cubed. And this is then delta mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon plus pi star mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon squared times 1 plus pi q squared. Let me make sure I've got all this right. Okay. Over q squared minus i epsilon plus pi q squared over q squared minus i epsilon squared plus pi over two. And that means we have delta mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon plus pi star mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon squared 1 over 1 minus pi q squared over q squared minus i epsilon or See, I've got various forms for this. I, I, I suppose the simplest is to write it this way. Um, 1 over q squared minus i epsilon times delta mu nu minus, no, plus q squared delta mu nu minus q mu q nu pi over q squared minus i epsilon minus pi q squared. And now delta prime is the photon propagator you want to use. That's the full photon propagator, yeah. For diagrams that have these loop corrections. Yeah. But it also captures the diagram without any loops too, right? Because it has it has the regular delta in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. How much time will we have a little time? So I've got all of these expressions. I'm I'm not certain as to which is the need just one of these. Alright, I'll, I'll just go through them all. Delta prime mu nu then is 1 over q squared minus i epsilon. And then we have delta mu nu. Let's factor out the delta mu nu. So we have a 1 here, but then we have a delta mu nu from here. And this delta mu nu, that one is q squared pi over q squared minus i epsilon minus pi q squared. And then minus q mu q mu pi over q squared minus i epsilon minus pi q squared. And so now I'm going to divide by q squared, and I'm going to ignore that epsilon. I, I'm, I'm taking the view that we've got the minus i epsilon here, and ignore the others. I think that that's OK. In that case, what we have here is delta mu nu 1 plus time over Canceling the q squared, 1 minus pi, minus q squared, I'm sorry, q mu q nu, pi over q 
squared one minus the time. All right, now, manipulating these two, you see you get one minus pi plus pi over one minus pi. So this is one over q squared minus i epsilon delta mu nu over one minus pi minus q mu q nu pi over q squared one minus pi. Okay. So now, what we really want is for this to be the regular propagator when q squared is zero. And so you see, if pi of q squared is um, zero, then this pole is in the right place. It's q squared, it's just one over q squared. There's the pole. And, well, actually, it's the residue of the pole that's being influenced by the 1 minus pi. So the res so if pi, so we want pi of q squared, or rather pi of 0, or equivalently, pi of q squared to be, say, v q squared plus higher terms, that way um, at q squared equals 0, the pole is here with residue 1. And then over here, this term, uh, so let, let's just imagine that it's pi of q squared, but ignore everything else. This is 1 over q squared minus i epsilon delta mu nu over 1 minus b q squared, and we're looking at this near q squared equal to 0, minus q mu q nu. And now I have b q squared. So that's b. The q squareds cancel, and I have 1 minus b q squared. Um, and so now, as we go to q squared equal to 0, um, the at q squared equal to zero, then we've got the pole, we've got the right residue, and um, we've got an extra term here, but the extra term is proportional to uh, q mu q nu, which is okay because of current conservation. That is to say, this these extra factors will, in fact, do exactly what they will do over here. Namely, they get multiplied by these electron lines, and these electron lines are such that um, the Q nu Q nu terms are going to give zero. So that's, that's basically the whole story. It's, it's regrettably rather complicated. Um, um, all of this, for example, I guess it's better not to assign that as a whole new problem. Okay. In any event, to let's see, we have one minute. Let me just say what what one finds out. Well, first of all, this is a vacuum polarization effect, and it contributes to the Lamb shift. How much? Not very much. It contributes um, delta E over 2 pi h bar, or delta E over h in other words, is a nu of minus 27.13 megahertz. So it's a small effect in the lamb shift, the lamb shift being plus 1058 megahertz. On the other hand, um, um, or, and, and this thing is sometimes called the Euling effect. Um, Uh, 
So what Weinberg does is compute the scattering and the effect of the of the scattering of, of the effect of this pi is to introduce a new potential V which is if if this has charge E1 and that E2, it's E1, E2, then an integral d cubed x, d cubed y, eta x, eta y, over 4 pi x minus y plus r, I mean this is r, and um, this eta, let me write it over here, this eta of r is delta cubed of r. Now the delta cubed of r is what you get from this. So if eta is a delta cube, you just get Coulomb potential, e1, e2 over 4 pi, the distance. It's eta of r plus 1 over 2 2 pi cubed And d cubed q pi q squared e to the i q dot r. So this pi of q squared enters into this effect, into this correction to the delta function potential. And so it's, it adds effectively a soft term to the delta function. And um, well, it's soft in what sense? Like scattering? What I meant was soft in the sense that it, this is a delta function. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, this is a Fourier transform pi of q squared and pi of q squared. Well, it's this formula, of pi of q squared, doesn't. Doesn't actually make it very clear what how q squared behaves. I'm not even sure it's solved. All right, well that's enough. Um, next time I'll say a few more things about this, and then go on and do some other uh, things related.